All right. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and I am the open source community advocate at Index Data and the moderator for today's event. Uh, today's forum is on the Folio Innovation Grants. Uh, this session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to uh, the Open Library Environment YouTube channel. Uh, as an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. Uh, and we have muted everyone except for the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, and I would uh, remind the speakers uh, also to, we have a large panel today uh, to uh, mute yourself uh, until it's uh, uh, your turn to go. Uh, please use the question box, uh, the Q&A box within Zoom uh, in order yeah. to answer questions or ask questions and uh, I'll pose them to the speakers uh, probably at the end of the session since we have a, a, a lot of speakers today. If you like to tweet, please use the hashtag Folio Forum uh, and I can relay those comments and questions to the panelists as well. Uh, we also encourage you to continue the conversation on, on this topic uh, on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Uh, let's uh, start today's forum. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Negi. Thanks, Peter. Um, so let me uh, just have some slides that I'll share with you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk to everybody about our Folio Innovation Challenge that EBSCO sponsored. Uh, it started last year, 2017. Um, and uh, ultimately, what we wanted to do was to challenge libraries, um, to challenge libraries to think about how we could build some new innovations, some new technology to help um, spear some further growth and development on the Folio platform that was not necessarily directed for the, the core direction of, of the Folio platform, but to think about how we could create some further innovations with this amazing technology that we're all working on, on building together. Um, so what we were able to do was to pull together a grant uh, valued at $100,000 to help seed um, some, some innovation, some development on the Folio platform that would be able to expand or extend on what the, what the original vision of Folio was, to think about how we could use Folio in innovative ways. Um, we wanted to make sure that libraries who wanted to take on this challenge um, could receive some money to help build on these ideas, these uh, great ideas that were coming forward, but to also make everything that was being created as open source so that any library uh, who wants to work with Folio, who wants to use Folio, can take advantage of these really exciting innovations. Um, we had a lot of really great applications um, and we awarded six different institutions. One of those lucky institutions got awarded twice. Uh, so hopefully we'll hear, uh, hear about, about that. Um, but we awarded seven grants for six different institutions uh, to create some really exciting new applications for the Folio platform. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the goal with this grant was to advance the adoption of Folio, but to advance innovation. Uh, and to help solve some, some uh, problems that libraries have been facing and look at how we could use Folio as, as an innovative uh, approach. Um, so we did it kind of in rounds um, and we had our very first round, which was in uh, 2017. And uh, we awarded two winners with the first round. We awarded uh, Villanova University uh, with their work with what they're doing with Viewfind and we're gonna hear from them uh, today. We also awarded the University of Illinois on um, some cool stuff that they're working on around circulation. Uh, and so we'll hear from them as well. Um, and then starting out in uh, 2018, uh, we launched our second round and awarded four winners this time. Um, we awarded uh, Johns Hopkins University for some work that, that they're building around 
um, patron facing functionality with the Folio platform. Um, and then also <coughs> Lehigh University, which uh, is working on taking some of the work that they've done with their current system and extending that work uh, to bring that to the, to the Folio platform. So we'll hear more about uh, exactly what they're doing. Um, and my slide stopped working. There's two more, University of Illinois. Uh-oh, now uh -oh. we lost your slides. Uh-oh, let's try that again. Um, instead of doing presentation, I'll just do it this way. Um, so we also have the University of Alabama and the University of Illinois, again, um, uh, also wrote in a, a really exciting second proposal uh, that we wanted to have included in the project. So at, at this point, I think um, I wanted to really make sure that the uh, award winners had as much time as possible to talk about the great work that they're doing. So I want to stop talking and hand it over to, uh, to our next presenter. Um, so I'm not exactly sure who that was next. Do you have the list in front of you? Uh, University of Illinois, I think, was first on the list. Wonderful. OK. Um, so I'll stop sharing. Um, we have uh, some, <clears throat> some slides we'll bring up here in a second. Um, uh, first off, we just really, uh, since we were fortunate to receive, um, you know, two rounds of funding, I just want to express our thanks of, to EBSCO. And, um, you know, we've, we've just been really fortunate um, to work on, on these projects. Um, Nate um, is our, our key programmer here. Our, he's uh, the brains behind the operation. <laughs> and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, several of the apps. I'm gonna give a background here. Um, so as, as already mentioned, we, um, we had some custom software tools that we had built. And um, it's uh, both sort of a, an irony and a paradox in the sense that these tools were developed because our library service platform that we had was not really meeting the needs of uh, some of the um, emerging services. So these were like custom, custom apps on top of our ILS. And so um, it was a, a great opportunity to see if we could incorporate them into the Folio code base. And at the same time, um, I was super excited ever since I'd first heard about what would become Folio, and, and that I, could, I still remember I was in Philadelphia in 2016, and uh, Sebastian Hammer was talking about the modular deconstruction of the library platform, and I was super excited because it looked similar to how we were thinking about our mobile apps. Um, and, and while we have a different implementation, uh, I think we have um, what I would call a um, uh, comparable and almost interchangeable uh, module type system, which, which was really exciting to see. Um, so we had really two overarching goals when we started this, and um, we, we've kind of uncovered a third that we'll, we'll talk about at the end. One was really uh, to allow our library system to learn more about just the, how Folio fits together, and, and we have an opportunity here to um, really dig in and explore it, and we were excited by what we found. The microservices approach to um, you know personalizing some of these end user services and um, and we uh, in our first uh, two applications that we made uh, some of the back end um, I guess I I, I want to make sure I'm saying this right um, some of the back end tools were um, emerging and they've sort of stabilized now um, and so um, we haven't directly incorporated into Folio just yet but I think with our this third grant. Um, our ultimate aim is that this will be sort of direct to the code base and um, that, that's our goal. And if we can circle back and uh, pull these uh, first two apps back into the code base. So um, that's kind of enough uh, exposition. I'll move into the, the, the applications. Um, so for our first one, we had an equipment loan form, which is uh, called our, our ELF form here. And what our equipment loan form does is it, um, we create a loan agreement form where students can sign for equipment that they check out. And many libraries check out technologies now. Um, our media commons is uh, circulating uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of, of items a month. Um, and really what, what we tested in this is 
uh, how does the back end of Folio, how do how does services sort of the back end API of Folio, um, how could that plug into some of our front end? And what we were able to do um, through through Nate's investigation what was pair our front end um, equipment loan form with um, uh, the back end APIs, and we were able to have a proof of concept about sort of this extensibility of services, and. Granted, I think of Foley as, as microservices based, but also um, with the equipment loan form, it was sort of um, meta services based in the sense that um, anything in the library that requires a form, um, so if you're gonna check out, say, a specific type of room, um, makerspace room, uh, VR design space, any types of those things, this could really be reused for that as well. Um, and um, yeah, that's the equipment loan form. Um, and moving on, we have uh, our course reserve waitlist service, which, uh, were you gonna talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name's Nathaniel Rickman, and as my boss Jim said, I, I do a little bit of the programming on the team. And um, so the way that we approach this is we, we have uh, services already at the U of I that we've kind of worked around the ILS system uh, with. So we built kind of uh, APIs on top of existing architecture and it's been kind of painful. So <laughs> our goal has been to try to migrate some of the things that we've developed in-house to the Folio system where the Folio system is actually designed to work like we would have hoped it to work. <laughs> so that's, that's been really exciting uh, to get involved. So for the first uh, project, which was the ELF, we used uh, electronic loan forms. And we try to use only the microservices, the back end uh, a copy interface uh, for that project to see, uh, to kind of explore Folio as we're developing too. So we're, we're exploring the idea of just using typical JavaScript for the front end and then using the Ocopio Folio stack for the back end. So it kind of speaks to uh, Folio's modularity and decoupled nature, which is really cool. For Hoot, uh, we took it to the next step and tried to uh, develop the front end uh, module as well. So um, I don't know if I can make this bigger here. Uh, I'll give it a quick shot. At the, at the end, we'll give you some links so you guys can check out the, the demo. Uh, but so our Hoot, is a uh, application that we built in house that uh, is for waitlist. So, for example, if someone's uh, checked out a book and then uh, a short loan book, and then someone else comes and wants the same book, then they'd be put on a waitlist. And uh, we have that developed in Java, and then so we created a folio version of it where we have uh, you can create waitlist for certain items. So, this would be kind of the selection screen. You can search for reserved items and then create the waitlist for it. And once you have the waitlist, sorry, the font's so small, uh, but once you have the waitlist, then you can add students to it. And what's really cool about this is that it will automatically notify them through email uh, once the item is checked back into the front desk. So, so the way it would work is uh, someone would come say, oh, I'm looking for a so-and-so book, and then the uh, they say, oh, sorry, it's checked out. I can put you on the wait list. And I put them on the wait list. And after 15 minutes, um, I mean, then after the book is returned, then a notification gets sent to the user through email that their book has arrived. And they have 15 minutes to come to the front desk to get the book. And that's, that's what this, this uh, reserves wait list service does. So that was, that was really fun. That was our last uh, grant. And then for our current grant, uh, sorry. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so for our current grant, we're trying to uh, go a step further. So we've worked with the backend modules, creating backend modules, and then backend modules and frontend modules all the way. And then now we're trying to create something to help students find books. Um, in the library, so if they have, if they know what they're looking for, they can search for it, and we would like to give them a map so that they say, "Oh, okay, well, we can start off at the front desk, and then uh, 
this is our current module. So we have a mobile app that does this right now for that we built. And we'd like to make a web version of this for Folio. So there you get a, a notification say, oh, I'm looking for the book called Cat. And here, here's the dot of to show you where it is at the library on a indoor map. So we kind of want to do the same thing for uh, the Folio module. And we're kind of excited because this involves making a plugin or exploring plugins and seeing how they work so that, to get the item look up. Um, and then we envision this to be on uh, maybe like a kiosk. So you could, you could put these uh, indoor maps, indoor locators on kiosks and have students you know, type in the, yeah. the book that they want and get, uh, get directions, turn by turn directions to it. So we have been having lots of fun and we're excited yeah. to keep on working on it. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, and Wayfinder is really one of my favorite modules that we've worked on in our in our mobile app. So it's a, a great pleasure just to see it having a life beyond here and getting it into Folio and out to other uh, academic libraries and even other libraries that want to use it. Um, I, you know, just some closing observations and sort of a closing observation and sort of a, a new goal. Um, we, you know, what we've kind of observed is that our you know, our Java-based APIs were really well suited for integration into Folio. There's some neat um, sort of next generation Java tools, Reactive Java, which was really exciting to look at. Um, and um, we, have, we have some demos and you could take a look at the code from our first two apps that we talked about on our GitHub page. And um, what we'd like to do now that um, sort of a new ILS has been chosen um, for our consortium, and it, and it wasn't really a choice that um, I had a lot of, um, I, I wasn't a part of the team that chose it, but we have a new platform that's going to be implemented. And although it's not Folio, what I've talked to our ILS team about is how could portions of sort of these apps um, supplement um, that ILS. And so we have some special end user applications here that might not exist, even, even in sort of the cloud technologies that are coming out right now. Um, they may not have um, these features and functionality. And so that's what we're going to look at is um, in what ways. Um, so it's, it's not really um, a full monolithic, like, well, there's nothing really monolithic about Folio, but it's not, it's like not a full implementation of Folio. It's like, what pieces could we use to supplement a platform that's here? And that's sort of, sort of the next step after we do this, this Wayfinder work. And, and I'm really excited for that part too. Um, and that's, that's sort of, um, that's what we had here, and we'd be happy to, I think we're answering questions at the end, but we'd be happy to um, chat with people later. And I'm not sure who's next on the agenda. Um, I think it was maybe, is John Hopkins next? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, well, let me share my screen. Oops. Okay. So can you all, can you all see my slide? Yes. Hi. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Daji Jiao. I'm a software engineer um, from Johns Hopkins Library uh, Application Group. Uh, I'm here with uh, Alistair Morrison. Uh, he's the manager uh, from, uh, for, for, the, for, for my group. And uh, so um, it, it uh, my presentation is uh, the tool that we're building, uh, which is a A to Z list. Um, we're using the Folio uh, technologies to build this. Um, it's it's a um, management tool as well as a patron uh, interface uh, to access our databases. Um, so uh, I'm building this with my with uh, the other colleagues from uh, my team listed uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, so, just give you a little background of uh, uh, this, uh, what this tool does. So, right now we have a legacy system. Uh, it's um, built on top of a, a, a really, I think it's a over ten years old technology called Xerxes. Um, uh, you can visit uh, this website at databases.library.jg.edu. Uh, 
uh, basically you have a, a A to Z list of all the databases that uh, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, have subscription to. Uh, and these are uh, hand-picked and uh, uh, curated by uh, subject librarians and they are organized by subjects. Um, one of the issue here you can see um, because a different, we have um, several libraries uh, are using this site and uh, so uh, you, if you look at the uh, from the subject list uh, there's African studies uh, from what's the size library uh, and Africana from the uh, Homeworld campus, uh, which is the main campus at Johns Hopkins. So, uh, they, but they're really related. So uh, that's one problem we are trying to solve in different libraries use different uh, taxonomies. Uh, the other problem we are trying to solve here is just uh, this system is not going to be maintainable in the future. Um, and I think the last version, you know, it was released like six or seven years ago and there hasn't been any update to the system. Um, uh, so uh, so we uh, applied for the grant and uh, I really appreciate uh, EBSCO to support this, uh, this work that we are doing. Um, and uh, we would like also to um, you know, build a uh, microservice-based uh, architecture for our um, systems uh, moving forward uh, and uh, we, we, we looked at different technologies and uh, we saw you know copy and folio the folio frameworks and we, we think this is a really good architecture for us to um, just in general to build our tools upon um, okay so this is the overall architecture of uh, you know we call it Aureo um, I know the last three letters stands for open library environment. I think the first one, three was open resource integration. I, I, I can't remember the acronyms. I'm really bad at acronyms. But uh, we're from Baltimore, so we thought Aureo is going to be a really fun name. Um, so the overall architecture uh, is basically on the right side of these, this side of the diagram here. Uh, Bottom, we have built the API uh, using uh, uh, using Java and RAML and uh, you know, Postgres SQL, uh, just following the examples of other modules. Um, through the Okapi gateway, uh, there will be a uh, Oka uh, Aureo staff UI. So there will be two interfaces. One is um, uh, a management tool uh, for our uh, library staffs. Uh, and then there's a patron UI. Uh, so the staff UI is going to be built, uh, well, it is uh, built uh, using stripes. And uh, the patron UI, uh, we, we just started the wireframing and uh, um, it, it's going to be a React uh, based uh, uh, web application. Uh, so uh, we, we also wrote some Python scripts to port data from our Lexis system database. Uh, which is a My, MySQL. Uh, so we, uh, the Python script basically uh, uses the uh, Okapi gateway uh, to post uh, uh, data to, uh, to the Aureo API, the Aureo database. Uh, we could actually, well, I, I'm a software engineer, so my talk will be a uh, pretty technical. I don't want to, you know, be too boring, but you know, this is what I enjoy talking about. So. Um, so, but the Python script uh, doesn't directly talk to the uh, to the database because we think you know uh, this is a good opportunity to check whether the gateway is working or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, the mod Aureo the API uh, we have, uh, as I said, it's it's based on RAML and uh, we we wrote our schema uh, .json file. And it can do CRUD operations. Uh, and uh, we also have permissions in the module descriptors. Um, that is really useful because uh, even in the staff user interface, uh, we would like to uh, restrict uh, some access levels to uh, certain, uh, certain staff members. So there could be different levels of uh, 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 administration uh, access uh, from the user interface. Uh, so uh, our implement, 
uh, we've done uh, most uh, uh, some implementations and uh, uh, we are using a really uh, test driven uh, process so we wrote a lot of tests for uh, the module implementations and uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, Farouk Sadiq uh, uh, he dockerized the module uh, so that we can uh, easily uh, deploy it uh, to the uh, vagrant based uh, VM. Uh, so our code is on uh, GitHub and uh, we use the Travis CI to do uh, continuous integration. So anytime we submit a code, it'll be um, built and, uh, and tested. Uh, we are having issues with building with the Open JDK. Uh, all the tests with uh, Oracle JDK, um, there's no problem, but since there's an issue with Open JDK, uh, we haven't figured out yet. Uh, so as I mentioned, we dockerized it, and uh, we are using the test testing backend, uh, Vagrant Box from Foley. So here is the uh, a screenshot of the uh, Stack UI. Uh, so this is basically a, a search interface. You can search anything, uh, and then uh, these are the list of databases and uh, we have some details. Um, we are still revising the data model. We're putting more data into it, but right now um, uh, this, this proof of concept interface is working. Uh, it uses the search and sort component in Stripes. And this is the edit uh, user interface. Um, um, yeah, pretty typical, I mean, Redux forms and you can uh, you can remove the uh, record to uh, I actually spent pretty, you know some time on this button then and other things is that there's no good example actually in other folio UIs at the moment I think um, okay. uh, the settings uh, we also added this uh, uh, control the vocabulary tool that uh, the staff members can um, you know editing or adding uh, things like more like facets, uh, like uh, here is an example of locations, uh, and but they can also add. Uh, we are we are also trying to add functionality like um, adding types and even let them uh, manage subject headings. That'll be uh, a little challenging. Uh, as I said, um, uh, the patient UI we're still uh, wireframe. Uh, everything uh, so this would be the, well, how, how it looks like uh, one thing uh, is you can uh, we, we, we added a requirement to um, be able to browse subject based on uh, a library so um, basically the medicine li the medical library might have different taxonomy than um, the music library apparently and they can actually see the subject headings differently. Uh, so that will solve the problem uh, I mentioned earlier uh, when you try to have different terms to describe the same thing. Um, yeah, the database list is pretty standard. Um, uh, lessons learned. Um, so I, I think, you know, as, as a developer, we need to update the modules uh, libraries regularly because things are moving really fast for Folio. Um, and uh, and I, I found some tools from Folio really helpful. The Remo Builder, the Okapi Client are a, few, a couple of examples. And uh, uh, there are two uh, virtual machines, the testing backend and the stable backend. Um, I found the testing backend is more useful than the stable one. Um, and Slack is awesome. I mean, if you have any questions, asking on Slack, and helps are always available. Um, DevOps is challenging. We're still working on it. Uh, so our next steps is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we're going to implement this taxonomy, uh, and uh, we want to fine tune the permissions. Uh, and uh, our data models is not complete. We need to implement the patron UI and uh, we still need to, um, you know, figure out details of DevOps. Uh, and we would also, uh, this will be the, in the next phase. Um, we, we want to integrate with our ERM workflows. Uh, all right. 
I think uh, I'm answering question at the end, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm not sure which who are the next. Yep, questions at the end, please. Uh, and uh, while they're, but we'll we'll pose them to the uh, presenters at the end. Uh, but uh, as you have them, put the the questions into the Q and A box, uh, and we will get them queued up uh, for the. Uh, presenters at the end. I think uh, next up is uh, Lee. Hi, uh, Michelle. Hi, I'm just going to share my screen. Yes, please. All right, we can see it. Awesome. Okay. Hi, um, Lehigh was awarded a grant to create a lost item folio application or folio module. Um, we currently have a working edition of this application that we built um, to work with our current ILS, which is Olay, so it's working in production right now. Um, our existing application has been really well received by our staff, so we thought it would be um, great if we could carry this functionality through into Folio um, for when we migrate and then also hoping that other libraries um, find it as useful as, as we have. Um, as far as um, you know, at this stage, we've really just, um, we haven't started coding anything. We've done some gap analysis to determine um, if the functionality that, that we need exists in Folio. Um, I'm going to demo our existing application so people can get a better idea of what it does or what it will do in Folio. But um, for example, in Folio, we'll need uh, custom item statuses. We'll need to mark, we'll be able to, we need to be able to mark something lost or um, purchase requested, et cetera. And um, I think the possibility of this application using the, the workflow module that's being worked on right now, um, has some real possibility. I don't know if that if the workflow module will be done in time and if it's not, um, we plan just to develop it the way we've developed it um, to tie into a lay and that's just kind of with email prompts um, if the if the workflow module is available for us to hook into. But I think down the road this really is a workflow in a sense. So um, you know maybe a, a version two of this can tie into the workflow uh, module. So I thought I'd just briefly demo our existing application um, so you can get a vision, an idea of our vision for, for how this will work in Folio. Um, so it kicks off with a weekly email. Um, so at a set time each week, there's a job that runs and gathers up all the items that have been marked with, there's a handful of statuses, um, like missing user requested or declared lost. Um, there's a few statuses that the, the program looks for. And um, when it finds those items, it matches them up with um, our library staff, reviewers, um, our subject librarians, and it sends them an email prompt asking them to review their list of items that are missing. And um, when they click the link in the email, they're taken to this screen, which I'll just make a little bigger. Um, so this screen, it's, it's really a simple concept. It's really a, a super simple application, but really useful because, um, you know, the lost items don't um, continue to accumulate over time. They're dealt with on a, on a regular basis. Um, so the subject librarians um, click the link in their email and they're presented with this screen. This screen only shows them the items that we're asking them to review. Um, so it's, it's not every lost item, it's lost item that's under their specialty, which we're determining right now by call number. Um, I got some really great feedback um, at WolfCon from um, someone at Duke mentioning that they might want to um, assign a reviewer based on language. So um, it just gave me something to think about. Um, you know, instead of uh, statically assigning by call number, there might be other attributes in, in the record um, that might direct the record to a different reviewer. So that, that was really useful feedback. Um, 
but you can see the screen really just gives some basic information about the item, um, some CERC information, some convenience links out um, so the subject librarians can research. And then it's really just um, they can add some notes here and they make a decision, either withdraw or purchase. Um, if they select withdraw, um, no one else has to do a thing with this record. Um, the application communicates with Olay and marks it withdrawn. It puts the note in the record. Um, it marks it as staff only. And if it's holdings and bib, um, if it's the only item for that holdings and bib up the hierarchy, those records are also marked staff only. So we envision it working very similar in, in Folio. Um, if they click the purchase button, um, an email goes out to our acquisition department, um, notifying them that the subject librarian would like them to purchase the item. Um, the status is changed in the item record to purchase requested. Um, there are notes added in the item in Olay uh, for reference back to the previous status and um, when the purchase request took place and if the subject librarian made any notes when they requested the purchase. Um, and actually I have Olay open so you can get an idea. Um, so these are the notes in Olay. Um, just making a note that, you know, subject library in BRS4 selected to purchase this item. Um, here you can see the status has changed to purchase was requested. And again, we, we envision it working very uh, similarly in, in Folio. Um, I think that's all I wanted to mention, but I'm happy to take questions at the end also. Great, thank you. Oh, what happened to my list of presenters? Sorry, Peter, I was relying on you for the list. Oh, okay, uh, I found it. Uh, next up is uh, Villanova University. Hello. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, and we can see your desktop too. Great. So I'm here to give an update on the Viewfind uh, Folio ILS driver that we were uh, given a grant to do. So to get started, I guess talk a little bit about who we are. So I'm Chris Hallberg, uh, and with Damian Katz, we are the two core developers of Viewfind. And I say core developers because we are very lucky to have a, a very active contributing community. Um, and with their help, we currently support nearly 20 ILSs, which is going to soon include Folio. Uh, Viewfind is an open source discovery layer that was started here and is used by hundreds of libraries all over the world. Um, and I will have a link to the GitHub at the end. So we initially applied to for this grant because it was definitely going to be a mutually beneficial thing. We're currently investigating our own uh, new ILS platforms. Uh, we always prefer open source, but of course, whatever we pick is going to have to work with Viewfind, our own open source system. So that would be a really good consideration, seeing as we'd have to create a driver anyway. But also adding an ILS, a major ILS system like Folio to the Viewfind software is a huge benefit for the community. It gives libraries all over the world an open source front end option for their open source folio system. And it expands the appeal of not only Viewfind, but also folio. So this is why we initially uh, pr proposed a grant and we are very happy and pleased and grateful to have received funding to go ahead with this project and uh, to, to, make, to make the process a little bit easier. So uh, we broke what we wanted to do up into three phases, which was uh, set up a folio server, get things going, make sure we have the test records, uh, do all the read only functionality, all the get requests with the API, and then move on to the post and finish up and make sure everything was ready uh, to move forward. Uh, I'm going to describe um, some of the particular challenges that we have and that we eventually triumphantly overcame, of course. Um, it's going to show the progress. So it's going to start off a little critical, but this story ends well and will continue to get better and better. This really shows the responsiveness and the overall progress of the Folio system 
uh, since we received our grant to do this. So uh, phase one is complete uh, at this stage, uh, but along the way we had a few, a few problems. I need to hide the video so I can see my whole slide. Uh, first off, the Vagrant instance was extremely easy to set up, but the hardware that we had available, even the most powerful spare computer that we had, uh, couldn't handle running VirtualBox. We couldn't seem to configure it cor correctly, uh, and it would crash. And even if we, you know, if it went a week without crashing, every time we reloaded it, all our custom loaded records were gone, uh, and all of the record IDs of the existing ones changed, which made testing very difficult. So we moved on to working through the single server installation on the uh, on the GitHub. And after a few tries, it was successful. There was a few instances where the software was ahead of the documentation. So I wanted to thank everyone on the Slack for being very responsive and helping us uh, get our server set up, which has been running with very little issue for quite a, a while now and is allowing us to really make a lot of progress um, since we got that all sorted out. As far as ingesting test records go, I had to do it manually for a while. I had to make my own uh, my, my own JSON record to import through the API from our mark records and uh, but luckily the new mod data loader project has come along. Uh, we had to update to the newest version of Folio which is fine um, but now that that's working we were able to import our usual test records which means that we can expand our usual test suite uh, that Viewfind uses to test the other ILS drivers which is very very exciting. Uh, there's no um, there's no mark exporting yet and uh, I put this on the mod data loader slide, not because it's something that should be part of this mod data loader project, which we intend to contribute, but because mod data loader might be a good place to start to look into how this could be done. Um, Viewfind's normal operation involves ingesting records that are exported from the ILS. So once this functionality is, uh, is created and finalized, uh, we can absolutely work that in there. It's gonna be a crucial part. So that maybe the mod data loader is a good place to start. But finally, the implementation of the real-time availability status, you know, the real minimum viable product uh, is working very well. And now that we're testing, we can remove some of these edge cases. So this is from our uh, working test instance with the Folio code. And on the top, you can see that the book is available. On the bottom, you can see that there was an error. Um, that's not a huge concern though. I left it in here intentionally because the ID for that particular record is intense. These are, uh, this is our uh, test record that has very crazy IDs. So the ID for the one on the top includes a backslash and a forward slash and a dollar sign. And the ID, the actual ID itself for the movie one inc includes every kind of quote you can throw at it. It's, it's very, it's a, it's a real edge case. But uh, this is not a situation we expect to have a problem with long term. It is really great to know that Folio supports older IP, uh, older IDs as identifiers. That was very easy. We thought that was going to be a, a bigger hassle than it was. It basically worked immediately without any custom code. Um, and it's good to know that once we start ingesting records directly into Folio, this won't be a problem because of the UUID uh, IDs that Folio uses, regardless of the identifier. So. Onto phase two, you can see from all the green check marks down the side that everything here went very smoothly and very quickly. We were able to read all the information once we had records in there. Uh, and we can you can currently sign in, check out your profile information, look at all the items that you have checked out. You can look at any finds that you might have uh, and the current holds. And the only reason I'm showing the current holds right now is a small uh, difference between the way that Viewfind does things and the way that Stripes does things. So if you end up testing the code or maybe this might be a configurable option for Stripes in the future, is that we're showing all the holds, uh, all three holds that were placed and only one is showing up in Stripes and that's because um, Stripes is only looking for holds placed on records that it checks out where Viewfind, uh, that are already checked out rather. And um, Viewfind doesn't make that distinction and allows people to place holds on books that aren't necessarily checked out. So while you can check things out, there's a few discrepancy here. Maybe we'll contribute some kind of configuration to Stripes in the future. So on to phase three, where we currently are. This is my uh, primary task right now. I have no other larger projects. So right now, placing holds is working. This is the screen that you'd be presented with and is currently supporting all four of these fields, the actual book itself and the comments and when you don't need it any longer or where you want to pick it up. 
Uh, and the next steps, the next major steps are canceling holds and renewing items, which will definitely be completed, I'd say, in the next week or two, which would very excitingly complete our initial obligation of uh, the grant. But there's still plenty more to do. Um, as I continue to work on this, you can see that that line of very small commands down the right side there are, are all the functions that you find can possibly support for an ILS driver. And uh, we're working our way through that list and seeing which ones can be added and not. I imagine that eventually every single one of these will be an available piece of functionality for the, the viewfind folio ILS driver uh, because of how modular it is and how robust the API already is at this point. So it's just a matter of working our way through the lists and uh, of course creating automated tests to make sure those things are always working by going to folio and getting some of the JSON outputs and saving them and creating tests out of them. Um, we also plan to contribute to the mod data loader because it's very uh, useful to us uh, and also to determine the record output workflows about making sure that all the records that are in folio can be exported in very useful formats so that not only viewfind can ingest them and make it search very very useful but also so that we can um, other libraries can do the same the, the the mod data loader is a good tool for this um, but it might not be the best fit for the actual exporting at minimum you know we should be able to just dump out the mark and it would be a real bonus to get a, a real-time approach where folio sends out notifications uh, but for now, neither of those tools seem to exist, but we definitely look forward to um, not only utilizing those tools, but possibly contributing to their uh, construction if possible. Um, and that's all that I have for now. I look forward to taking questions at the end, of course. If you have any more direct questions about Viewfind, you can email myself or Damien uh, directly at these two email addresses. And I'm going to post the link down here uh, into the chat. The, the GitHub page is the Viewfind project, and that particular pull request is the up-to-date code uh, and the overall approach to what's going on. Uh, and if you have any discussion, that would be the best place to put it, in particular for the, the Folio ILS driver. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. And I believe the University of Alabama is on deck uh, for the next slide. So I'll stop sharing, and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Let's see, this is Kevin Walker at the University of Alabama. Um, I'm looking for how to share my screen. Okay, got it here. All right. Yep, it's coming up. Yes, we can see it. All right, great. Um, Steve is actually out sick today, so he won't be joining us. Um, but my name is Kevin Walker, and I'm the head of assessment here at the University of Alabama and a member of uh, this particular development team. And um, we're going to talk today about the assessment module that we're currently working on. Um, basically, as you work with a variety of, of different integrated library systems that are out there, especially those that are a bit more long lived, like Voyager, for example, uh, you begin to notice that there are few, if any, canned assessment reporting um, systems or, or uh, functionality. And, you know, why is this? Well, basically because uh, as those who regularly engage in library assessment through the ILS um, can tell you, you know, it's difficult to provide a one size fits all uh, reporting functionality for libraries. Uh, the main reason is that, you know, catalogs and cataloging practices and uh, data structures and basic library policies differ not only across libraries, but within libraries over time. Um, and this is, of course, going to affect the data that's in the ILS and therefore the manner in which uh, one would design any particular assessment query. Um, nevertheless, this module is an attempt uh, to build an assessment reporting solution that provides some basic canned reports that are, are quick and easy to use. Um, importantly, we do this by establishing access to uh, widely used and what we might consider foundational ILS data elements, um, something, we, we could define this as, as those metrics, you know, gathered on a regular basis across numerous national library statistical surveys like the ARL, ACRL, and IPEDS surveys. Um, and then we um, provide simple functionality that allows for a certain level of customization 
um, that makes the tool useful across a, a variety of organizational contexts. And, and for the end user, this module will provide quick and easy access to assessment data with no need for experience writing SQL um, queries. Um, this module provides what are essentially CAN reports, but with uh, custom data filtering that eliminates the one size fits all problem we see with most canned in app reporting. And, and finally, the data visualization functionality that we incorporate uh, into this module provides analytical assistance to users in the form of uh, quick data pattern recognition. And this is especially helpful when conducting collections assessments that include data from across millions of library volumes or dozens of item types or item locations, et cetera. Uh, for the folio development community, we, we, our intention has been to kind of scout ahead uh, of the community along the data analysis and visualization fronts. And uh, with this in mind, we think we're providing some value through this development project that will uh, easily be built upon or improved by others. Uh, we've tackled a few basic challenges of creating uh, a reporting system, um, like building some basic analytical functions that identify various types of data, as well as uh, certain data categories seen only in libraries. And this should provide other developers with tools uh, or roadmap that can aid with the design of additional functionality. And uh, finally, we believe that uh, as the point of the reporting sphere, so to speak, outside the reporting SIG, of course, um, we are in a unique position to help verify uh, the functional validity of, of various data element mappings uh, within Folio as they emerge. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Drew Parker, who's going to talk a little bit more about the development process. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so I, I am Andrew Parker. I'm the Web Development Project Lead here at the University of Alabama. I'm going to talk about our current progress with the module. Uh, so we are using RAML Module Builder for the server-side module. Uh, we currently have just implemented two endpoints of that module. We have a subject and a, a format endpoint. Uh, for visualization, we're using React Plotly. Uh, Plotly is just a graphing library built on top of D3, and React Plotly is just Plotly components for React. So uh, the subject endpoint that we've currently created will run a library's holdings, and specifically the Library of Congress call numbers uh, of those holdings, through the Library of Congress classification outline, and then just return JSON indicating the number of holdings that fall into each part of the classification. Uh, this doesn't output CSV yet, uh, but it will, and we intend all of our assessment endpoints to return CSV. Obviously, a lot of the useful things you might do with this data would uh, require you to have something, require you to have the data in a format like CSV. Uh, so this is just sample JSON output from the subject endpoint. You can see that the entire classification outline is represented in the JSON output. You see beginning and ending numbers for each part of the classification outline, the number the library's holdings that fall into each of the subcategories. Uh, we don't have the actual visualization implemented in our Stripes module yet. So I, I can just show like a proof of concept we created in Plotly. It's not in React Plotly, but I'll just play this YouTube video here. Let's make sure this is. So this is the, these are the top level classes of the classification outline. You can narrow to language and literature. You see the subclasses beneath that. I believe I clicked on English. You can see the categories beneath that. And you can navigate back up to visualization. This is a pretty crude prototype, uh, but this is what we intend to implement in React Plotly and won't take much more time for us to actually have that in our module. So one challenge we ran into with the subject endpoint is that we couldn't find a usable JSON version of the Library of Congress classification outline. We ended up parsing Mark ourselves uh, for that purpose. Uh, that is a Mark representation of the classification outline. Uh, we also have a format endpoint. It doesn't, it's basically just a placeholder at this point, but one of the requirements of our grant projects is to return a library's holdings by format and like, similar sort of visualization as we saw with subjects. That's currently not working with Folio data. Uh, so as Kevin alluded to, we have like a more freeform visualization component to our project that we're working on. And uh, Jahan Jiang, our data services librarian, created a prototype for that 
and then I'll share kind of like our, our progress thus far on implementing that. So I'm going to let Jahan take over here, and then I'll, I'll jump back in. This is Jahan Jiang, um, Data Services Librarian here at the University of Alabama. As Drew just mentioned, we use um, JavaScript called uh, Portal to View uh, Visualization Plots. We choose this instead of something else because it's um, interactivity and flexibility in generating high quality plots. Besides, the syntax is very straightforward and uh, it also got all of Python versions that are, you know, uh, very popular in uh, data analytics field. That means, you know, larger community keep contributing to the um, library development. So far, we have a prototype of functions uh, built up ready for integrating with Stripe. Uh, the module that we have done have uh, several features. For example, um, it could handle different data types such as categorical uh, data, numerical data, the date to data. And uh, it can also deal with the multiple dimensionalities that you know, uh, definitely go beyond just X, Y axis. And also we got high scalability, meaning that you could you know, switch axis, turn on and turn off ticks, uh, or standardize probability density functions. Also, um, we try to make it very, uh, uh, adjustable, meaning that you could change the window size, jack plus to different um, areas. So basically what we are doing is a free version of the Tableau and Folio, right? So um, here is a little demo that we could show. These are the prototype of functions and then um, here are some numerical functions that we need when um, trying to get uh, plot function and then we have plotting functions for example you can see uh, um, PDF which is probability density function pipe plot chart plot and uh, we could run a bit test to show the uh, utility of this plot so for example this would be a example uh, for a three-dimensional data where you can easily click in or out you know uh, particular groups to filter. And you can also drag in and select it. For the um, data frame table, you can select how many rows you want to see. Also, we got sorting functions. And also keyword search function, that way you can type uh, certain word to uh, narrow down records. And the other example that we can show is a uh, probability density function. Um, so we have different functions like that, as you can see from the screen. Um, you can easily change it to um, cumulative density functions as well. And that would be it. I'll turn it to um, Drew again. Thank you, Shahan. So I wanted to talk about our current progress, which is somewhat of a far cry from what we're aiming to do with our, our very ambitious uh, project here. It's pretty limited what we uh, actually have implemented right now. Uh, you can switch between inventory and users data. Uh, you can select the type of graph, uh, by, par, or line. The histogram functionality isn't yet merged into our master branch. You can change graph size and opacity, but that's really it. So it's, it's uh, still at a very early stage. Here's a screenshot. Uh, this is the source metadata from folio testing backends. It's not extremely interesting uh, because the metadata in folio testing backend isn't very interesting. But uh, you can see a single dimensional visualization that's that's functional there and that uses, actually, I think it's using instance storage, instance storage uh, endpoint, or the instances endpoint in instance storage. Uh, and then you can see users, uh, this is a breakdown of the users that are active and not active. Uh, so, I mean, for single, there are some single dimensional visualizations that what we have in uh, our modules that it's currently useful for, but uh, multi-dimensional visualizations don't work very well. And of course, we, we do want to support multiple dimensions. Uh, there are all sorts, like, so it might be very useful for you to filter users in certain ways instead of trying to look at all of the users uh, that uh, exist in the system. Uh, you would quite possibly 
also uh, we would expect to implement like a, a record functionality like you saw in Jahan's prototype at the bottom as well, where you would see, be able to browse the records that you were currently looking at in some capacity. But uh, so I, I thought I'd just very quickly touch on next steps with the time that we have left. Uh, we would like to start working with kind of our actual data for patrons for you know, our, our bibliographic data instead of which just a what's in folio testing backend. Uh, we are a data site. So what's done there to, to migrate our data into folio that can be used for the purposes of uh, our module development. Uh, we have uh, students that are contributing to this uh, module development and we want to continue to get them comfortable with the technology because they didn't have prior experience with any of it. Uh, and we're going to continue to monitor what the reporting ZIG is doing and ensure that what we're doing to the best of our ability is going to complement what they're going to do. Because um, what they're going to do is uh, still developing, I guess, is a way to say it. So uh, those, are, those are sort of our immediate next steps. And that's it. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can. Uh... Tell Stephen you guys did a good job, uh, uh, even though he was sick today. And uh, of course, he'll be able to uh, catch up uh, on it on the recording as well. Uh, so in a moment, uh, I'm going to ask the uh, two presenters who uh, uh, answered questions in uh, the, the text uh, Q&A box uh, to kind of uh, give us those same answers uh, verbally so that we can get them on the recording. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to encourage uh, people to continue to ask uh, questions in that Q&A box. Uh, and we will go as long as we have questions to be answered and, and presenters to answer them. Uh, so let's go back to, to Lehi for a moment. Uh, there was a, a question asked, uh, why wouldn't you want to create a new item uh, if you want to purchase a replacement rather than updating the item record uh, of the lost item. Right. Uh, go for it, Michelle. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. Um, we didn't take that route because in Olay, um, when a purchase order is created, um, there's the option to have a new item created. It also gave our acquisition department a little bit more control over um, managing that data but I, you know when I when I read the question and started thinking about it I, I think that's something that we should reevaluate as we move into folio um, you know I really like to maximize and automate everything that we can possibly automate um, taking advantage of folio APIs so I could definitely see that um, as an option as we move forward great thank you thanks yep I uh, and for uh, the uh, uh, Villanova, uh, Christopher and Damien, uh, where would discovery metadata, uh, bib data, and holdings slash items data uh, be coming from? Uh, for example, the uh, inventory or mark storage or both? Yeah, so for the, for the most part, we ingest all the metadata into a faster search area for here uh, and for most instances it's called it's solar is what we use um, it doesn't necessarily need to be any particular format of metadata view fund is supposed to be metadata agnostic but for the most part the way that it normally works at least our setup here at villanova that uses view fund is we take the information from the ils and store it and ingest it into solar for faster responses so all the metadata of title author year also like location call number if there's a url if it's an online thing that's all stored in the search engine which makes like response really quickly but there are certain things we can't index like uh you know real-time availability if i'm gotten checked out we always go to the ILS for that kind of information. So while you'll get the metadata very quickly and from a local uh, instance, you, you will be sending requests out to the ILS for holdings, where the holdings are, if they're available. And of course, if you place holds, that'll all go through the ILS as well. Um, David, is there anything you want to add to that? Or? So uh, as far as how we would implement this in the context of Folio, uh, as Chris mentioned in his presentation, that's that's the area that seems not to be as fleshed out yet 
on that end. And I think some of it is complex because Folio, like Viewfind, is trying to design itself to be metadata agnostic. Um, so the easy scenario, because it's like what has been done in the past, is if you're using Folio with just mark records, it would be great to have a way to just suck all the mark records out of Folio's mark storage and shove them into Viewfind, and then it'll all work the old school way, and it's easy and not much work. Um, but we also want to be looking toward the future. And so, you know, something that would be a little more exciting would be having real-time notifications of actions in Folio triggering actions on the Viewfind side. So if somebody edits a record, we get notified and we can update the index immediately instead of what most people do right now, which is have like an overnight process that syncs things, which leads to delays and, and so on. Uh, and also, as Chris says, the current model most people use is you index just the bibliographic data so you can do fast searching and lookup, but then you do real-time uh, lookups from the ILS for status information. But if we had some kind of a notification system, it might be possible to index everything uh, and then have less direct reliance on the Folio backend uh, from the Viewfind software, uh, at least in terms of looking things up for obviously patron interactions, you're always going to have to go straight to the source. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna pause for a moment to see if any other questions come in. Uh, I'm gonna uh, also note that Jim and Chris uh, in the uh, Zoom chat uh, posted links to uh, their code and uh, uh, other uh, documents. Uh, and so we'll be sure to put those in the description of the YouTube video uh, when we post it on the Open Library Foundation uh, YouTube site. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, Andrew or any of the panelists, any final thoughts? Uh, Andrew, you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the panelists for their time today and all the great work that they're doing. This is really exciting to see. Um, so uh, I just want to thank them all and, and really look forward to seeing this, this, all this uh, work that they're doing coming to fruition. Uh, I'm really surprised at how quickly things have been moving um, uh, with, with those teams working on their own and, and contributing and getting involved with some of the special interest groups. Uh, and getting involved in, in some of the core development work to help with their projects. So I just want to again thank thank all the uh, the uh, the panelists today for their for their great efforts and uh, for all their enthusiasm on what they're working on. Indeed, thank you. Uh, this uh, I think we've reached an end. Uh, this concludes today's forum on the Folio Innovation Grants. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag FolioForum. Uh, today's uh, recording of today's forum will be posted to YouTube shortly. That's uh, if you search YouTube for the Open Library Foundation, uh, there will be a Folio Forum channel uh, for that account. Uh, our next Folio Forum will be on November 14th, uh, and the topic is a roadmap update. Uh, this is something we like to do uh, every four months or so, and four months has swung around, uh, so uh, be sure to uh, uh, look out uh, for the registration link for that coming out in the Folio, next Folio newsletter. Uh, thank you to our speakers uh, and everyone who asked questions and added comments. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>